this talk about, I will quickly introduce um, domain-driven design and also how to structure large Nux apps um, based on our experience. Uh, one sentence about me. So I'm Anton, I'm a software developer at MindFuel. We are building data-driven products. And if I'm not coding, I'm either brewing coffee or riding my bike, and mostly in that order. And the slides for today and also the demo is available on GitHub. You can check it out. Um, it's already prepared for you. So um, see you there. If you have questions, just uh, ping me. And the problem I'm talking about is um, how to structure large apps and sites. Um, I think all of you have experience in building um, Nux um, applications. And the more the, it bigger it gets, and the more complexity uh, is created. Also, the maintain maintainability is lower. If you add some new developers, um, mostly the components, helpers, uh, services are scattered around the, the project. And um, we were looking for ways to, to make that more maintainable, more clear. and when we did research, we came across um, domain-driven design a couple of years. Um, I hope you have heard about it because it's a really um, great concept. Actually, it's quite old. Um, so it was initially introduced in 2004 um, in this book. It's really amazing. I should, uh, I can really recommend um, you to get this. It's uh, independent of any technology or implementation. It's really a high-level concept of how how do I structure, or how do I how do I model the real world. Um, to represent um, the problem the business or the client has, and how do I how do I name classes? How do I do all this stuff? How do I cut the things out? And um, a couple of months ago, I also found this post by Philip, which is also amazing because he also tried the same thing in in Nuxt apps. And yeah, there's a, a healthy discussion on that topic. Um, and to give you a brief introduction into the topic is um, yeah, most central to domain driven design, of course, is the domain. So the the problem, the, the, the process that you're going to implement in your software. And the idea is that it requires a deep understanding from the, the developer to really build what uh, the business needs. And that's um, called the ubiquitous language. So it's kind of a common language between the developer and the business. So in naming classes, in naming objects, in naming data, um, this is really helpful um, if you grow bigger with your um, tool. and. DDD basically assists in building software that actually solves the problem. So it's independent, as I've said, of the implementation, and it really has different shapes, different steps you can um, you can can use. And one of these concepts that I'm going to point out today is bounded context. So it's one of the most central things in domain-driven designs, and it says that um, if you have a large large problem, a large software that you implement, it cannot be modeled in a unified unified way. So there are always kind of sub-modules, sub-parts that are to some extent logically um, connected to each other. And you try to make this as one uh, cohesive um, kind of module, you can say, or, or context. Um, it doesn't have to be implemented as a module. So there's a, a discussion about if that's really that's what they mean, meant or not. But it could be. And today, we uh, have, will have an ex uh, example of how that is done in Nuxt. Um, so the example I'm going to present to you is, of course, um, something related to biking. Um, so let's say um, we build an agency for biking, uh, Anton's Bike Tours. And our agency has a blog where our marketing team um, writes about some stories uh, or some, some stories about our, our trips. We have a booking, a payment part that's really yeah um, focused on making sales. We have the tours where we outline how the tour looks like. And we have a mapping and also some settings for the user that he can take and to adjust um, some parts of the application. So this is this is basically the feature set that we would like to implement. And you would go ahead, create a new Next app. It comes with the default structure. Uh, you will start implementing the block. So the block consists of a couple of components, of course, um, that, that make out the, the front end. There's a helper maybe that needed for, to create the slugs. There's a store, of course, to manage the database interactions and to give some, some loading spinners or whatever. And of course, there's some routes to actually render um, render the components and also make the the dynamic uh, routing for the for the posts. And there's a service to load some data. And then you go ahead with the next module, the booking and the tours and the map and the settings. And it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And at the end, you end up with something like this. Um, everything is scattered across um, across the project and different folders. And it's totally OK. And, and for one developer or two developers, this is still OK. But if the, the thing grows even further, it's 
it's getting messy at some point. Um, you will have some overlap, and if you want to remove or update one feature, you will be there will be an overload in your um, yeah as a developer to find what you actually need to change, what you need to adjust. So we were looking into different ways to make that or to optimize that. And one way is uh, modules. So modules is a really versatile feature in Nux. I can I can really uh, stress that um, it's, it can do so much and fast. What we try to do is basically have kind of sub sub apps in our big app. Um, so the the first step to a micro front end, the micro front end would be even more complex. But module is actually a quite easy concept. So it's basically a subfolder that has its own scope, that has its own um, yeah component uh, store, etc. In a subfolder, and of course on the on the root level there will there could uh, there should still remain some components like the, the UI, for instance. This is just an example of a, of a button that can be reused by all the others. Of course, this, this still remains, but in the heart, um, we try to make modules for everything that's kind of uh, logically connected. So if you go ahead and do that, you would end up if the block module would look like this. So it only has what it actually needs, and it's only related to, the, um, to this namespace, basically. And if you go ahead, and do that for all the for the other features. It will look like this. Everything is a bit more structured and and, and cohesive, and that's what we were aiming for. Um, I will now go ahead and give a quick demo. I, I set up a small Next application today to build that up. Um, so this is the this is the the app. It has right now only the block and the booking. Both of them are the two modules that I've just presented. They're using UX to to load the data from the UX store or from any API. It's just a just mocking. And if you take a look into the view um, UX state, you will see that um, whenever I change from block to booking, the booking module is actually registered again. So this is um, as you expected, because the booking maybe is not something that's really used by every customer that's going to our website. It's only for a couple of customers. So it can be even unregistered after after loading, so it's also optimized for yeah loading times and yeah and performance. And the block, of course, is something that most of our users will uh, will uh, see. So it's a global module, and as you can see, it's not uh, it's not changing. Only the booking is changing. Looking into the code itself, uh, we still have a couple of minutes in my talk. You see that there are now two modules, block and booking, and the only thing to, you have to do is basically register the modules once in the modules property. You just have to reference the index file. The index file is basically the installer for your module. So let's take a, take a look how the index file looks like. It's um, something that runs on build time. So it's using Node.js um, to do that. So it's not, it's, it's the, if you have it compiled and running on the server, everything will be in one JavaScript file, of course. But this is basically running at build time, as I just said. So what you would do is, First, uh, register the module. It's a function, and you take a hook. Um, and what you do is you register the components you need. So in my case, I just have one component um, directory, and all the components that are in that file. Um, the, right now, it's just only one. Um, the block article list um, are um, yeah in the scope of of you. And the next thing is the routes. So I'm, I'm extending the router. I'm adding the block route that um, renders my block um, component, which is here. Um, the last part that you've seen is um, a plugin. Uh, the plugin is needed to install or register the store globally. Um, so if you take a look, um, it would go here, register. And the only thing it does is it loads the store, which is a standard UX store. Um, and it adds it as a module to the, to the store. Um, to the global store, and it's it's also namespace. This is what this is saying, and then you can you're ready to use it. Same for the booking. The only difference in this case, the the bookings the booking store um, is actually installed or registered in the async data method, which is also really interesting, and then it's destroyed um, when the component is um, unmounted. So this is um, how you would do it. Something that's kind of used. Rarely in the application, like an onboarding wizard, a tutorial, something like that, can be really encapsulated in a module. So, um, yeah, let's go back to the presentation. That's all I wanted to show. If you have any questions, you can approach me. Feel free to ping me, uh, write me an email. I'm I'm happy to hear your feedback, and I think 
I'm perfectly in time. So thank you so much for having me and uh, see you around.